the way that I've, ah, yes, the way that I've uh, decided to do the presentation is actually to read the introduction of the book and uh, add in a couple other smaller sections that apply specifically to higher education. So you'll get the broad sweep of the book's arguments and its context, as well as some specific content with respect to higher education. And there's some historical higher education context uh, to thinking about Althusser's work, uh, that is to say the emergence of the 1968, uh, May 1968 protests, and then um, his sort of debate with Ranciere uh, in the middle and late 1970s, and that's the ground we'll cover. I'm going to throw a link into the chat, which is a, a shareable link to the book, because the publishers have made it open access, which I think uh, Christian's email may have mentioned. So there's the book you can have it, uh, which I'm really excited about. And I wanted to thank Bloomsbury for doing that because it makes all the difference. Okay, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna jump in. I'm gonna read this introduction and then I'm gonna share a few slides that have a few images when it comes to the higher education stuff. Okay, so a student or researcher interested in the French communist philosopher Louis Althusser's theory of education might encounter a recent entry in the Encyclopedia of Educational Theory and Philosophy. According to the entry, Althusser's theory of the ideological state apparatuses was an attempt to overcome economic determinism. However, the theory failed due to Althusser's structuralism, which, the entry notes, was widely criticized for its functionalism and its denial of individual and group agency. The entry concludes that, according to Althusser's theory, students and teachers and others involved in education are, quote, mere puppets of controlling, coercive, and ideological structures, unquote. The entry's author is Raymond A. Morrow, co-author of the seminal tome, Social Theory and Education, a Critique of Social and Cultural Theories of Reproduction, tracing the history of social reproduction theory and education that includes a full-fledged version of his entry's interpretation of Althusser. Morrow's not alone in this interpretation. He follows a common sense about Althusser in the critical education literature more broadly in English. One can find a version of Morrow's reading in early foundational texts by the field's founders, Michael Apple and Henry Giroux, to more contemporary references. The consensus in the field still prevalent today is that while Althusser's theory of ideological state apparatuses was an important attempt at understanding education in a capitalist society from a Marxist perspective, it ultimately failed because of its functionalism and its inability to recognize the concrete agency of people working, people in and around schools. While this reading has an air of finality, in the same year Morrow's entry in the encyclopedia was published, Althusser's book on the reproduction of capitalism appeared for the first time in English translation in 2014. The significance of this translation should not be understated. The book is the full text from which Althusser's famous essay on the ideological state apparatuses was initially excerpted. That essay called Ideology and the Ideological State Apparatuses Notes Towards an Investigation has for more than a generation provided the definitive account of Althusser's thinking about education. But the book from which it was excerpted was rarely mentioned in educational research literature, if ever. It was only available in French in 1993 and had not been available to English readers until 60 years after the excerpt was published. Juxtaposing Morrow's encyclopedia entry on Althusser and on the reproduction of capitalism published in the same year broaches the question of revisiting Althusser's theory of education. Althusser is having something of a renaissance in the humanities and social sciences with several other new translations published of his own work, including the first full English translation of Reading Capital. Part of the resurgence has focused specifically on the ideological state apparatuses, ideology and reproduction. Uh, and while some early voices hinted at a revision in education, the more recent turn to Althusser has yet to hit educational research. And given that we have the full text from which the original expression of Althusser's groundbreaking theory was excerpted, and given the new wave of interest in the theory, education scholars should be curious about the content of Althusser's theory of education how the common sense reading of it emerged in critical education, and whether that common sense holds up. Althusser in Education, this book, looks at these issues. Following recent examinations of critical education's presumptions in history, the book is a clarificatory project for critical education, both regarding Althusser's theory of education specifically, how it was critiqued, and how it was advanced, examining assumptions, frameworks, and axioms in left education thinking generally. 
The book has three main parts. In the first part, Education as an Ideological State Apparatus, 11 Rules, I lay out Althusser's theory of education by doing a close educational rereading of the, um, of the ISA's essay, or the Ideological State Apparatus's essay, as an excerpt of the book from which it was taken on the reproduction of capitalism. The book, makes, uh, the book provides much needed detail, clarification, and elaboration on the notes towards an investigation that Althusser made in that ISA's essay 50 years ago. From this educational rereading of the ISA's essay, deepened deepen by a reading of the book from which it was originally excerpted, I derive 11 rules of thumb for understanding Althusser's theory of education in its fullness. These rules cover major themes in the theory, like social reproduction, relation of production, structural causality, apparatus, and so on. Table one lists the rules and the theoretical terms to which they apply. The rules are best summarized as follows. Social reproduction for Althusser is the key to the key to production, the process of maintaining the continuity of dominance for the relations of production preferred by the ruling class, which is distinctly Marxist compared to early references to the concept like that of Durkheim in, in the book Suicide. These relations of production are how people have their hands on the means of production and thus define an economy. Relations of production set out positions which people occupy or functions that they bear, but crucially for Althusser, these, these positions exist imminently rather than transcendently. The ruling class cannot maintain their preferred relations of production solely through economic power. They need state power too. According to Marx, the state is a superstructure exerting the kind of downward facing force needed to keep certain relations of production dominant now and over time. In Althusser's rendering, building on a distinction from Gramsci, there are two superstructures, ideological and repressive the former manifesting as imagined relations to real conditions, while the latter works through violence. These two apparatuses are relatively autonomous from one another and from the economy, each exerting a special third of the total social force in the society. The ideological state apparatuses are themselves composed of systems of institutions. These institutions reproduce dominant ideology to the extent that people in them tow a dominant line. Towing the line in this case means engaging in certain practices that anchor aspects of and thereby reproduce the dominant relations of production. Education is the number one ideological state apparatus in modern capitalist societies, since it instructs so many young people in skills and submission to the dominant ideology. In schools, students learn to go all by themselves and tow the line without a cop in their heads or the immediate threat of violence. This recruitment, which occurs through what Althusser calls interpolation, does not happen because there are a group of evil priests or diabolical leaders pulling people's strings like puppeteers, but rather occurs largely unconsciously in the everyday experience of class struggle. All these claims regarding school and reproduction of the relations of production rely on a particular concept of causality, since apparatuses in the theory are means for intervening in society, exerting a force towards some group's interest. Following a Spinozist ontological turn, Althusser's concept of causality is structural rather than linear or expressive, distinctive for its emphasis on unevenness and complexity, refusing the fustian or unclear thought that, as Althusser cites Hegel, citing Schelling, sees, as, sees all cows as gray in the night. According to the structural concept of causality, ideologies do not determine institutions, but rather the other way around. While class struggle impacts schools, it does so via primary ideologies external to them and secondary ideologies from within them, the latter tending to be specific to their context. In this sense, schools contribute to the larger class struggle. Insurgent classes have used ideology as a weapon and won victories against the ruling class, making the ISAs or the ideological state apparatuses uh, a site of struggle. The first part of the book explains each of these rules using textual evidence and arguments Althusser sketched in the ideological state apparatuses essay and detailed with more premises and elaboration in on the reproduction of capitalism. The rules form a basic framework for Althusser's theory of education, incorporating crucial philosophical and political premises that undergird the idea that education is an ideological state apparatus. In general, I find that the theory is a dynamic and profoundly influential Marxist theory of education whose imminent structural framework emphasizes school's complex contribution to class struggle from the large scale relative autonomy of schools in Althusser's conception of the base superstructure model to the significance of small scale everyday school gestures in his concept of interpolation. The theory was taken up in a different way in education, however, 
the common sense about Althusser remains stubbornly in place. Left education literatures inherit that interpretation today in the form of critiques mentioned at the outset, of which Morrow's entry is just one example. In the second part, the common sense, of Al common sense about Althusser reassessing critical education, I trace the provenance of this common sense. Using Morrow and Torres's history of social reproduction theory as a guide, I begin with the founders of critical education in the US, Michael Apple and Henry Giroux, looking at theories, um, looking at references to Althusser in their early publications leading up to Giroux's theory and resistance in education and Apple's education and power. When it came to Althusser, I find a mixture of reverence and repulsion with accompanying indecision and reversals in their readings. I call the readings found the foundations of critical education since the texts which include these inconsistent readings of Althusser did so much to construct the presumptions on which critical education is founded, like the dichotomy between reproduction and resistance. I also find that Giroux and Apple's readings relied on a number of other interpretations. Giroux went so far as to say that these interpretations were so definitive as to not require his further attention as part of their larger project to contrast critical education from neo-Marxist education in the US they leaned on a line of critique against Althusser running from Jacques Rancière, Michael Urban and Dennis Gleason, Alex Kalinikos, Paul Hurst, E.P. Thompson, Raywin Cannell, and ended with Paul Willis. While Giroux writes that Althusser has already been interpreted by these authors, so we don't have to, I delve into the text to reconstruct the line of critique on which Giroux and Apple relied, but also informed other similar critiques like that by Simon Clark in England. I do some historical work to contextualize the critiques and their authors, summarize their arguments, and show how each account has limitations that Apple and Giroux and those who followed them failed to consider. I used two tests for this reassessment of the texts Apple and Giroux cited. The first test is whether the text has an argument. The second test is whether that argument poses significant issues for the framework set out in part one. Generally, the common sense about Althusser and critical education and the line of critique on which it rests are composed of three planks, the critique from functionalism, the critique from agency, and the critique from tragedy. The first characterizes Althusser's theory as being part of a school of social theory, functionalism, which is at odds with the basic premises of Marxism. This critique points to functionalism's tendency to understand social phenomena as having simple and clear purposes in maintaining equilibrium and its rootedness in non-Marxist trends of intellectual history as a point against Althusser. Functionalism's focus on cohesion and order is ultimately bourgeois, says the critique, and thus, so is Althusser's theory. Perhaps more devastating, however, is the second plank, that Althusser's theory does not provide a proper concept of agency. According to this critique from agency, the theory is at best silent on the question of freedom and at worst antithetical to any notion of it. On this view, Althusser's theory renders social forces so strong that they determine the thoughts, actions, and the group activity of individuals, such as student organizers, teachers, the entire working class, or whole institutions, such as schools or universities. Finally, the last critique is from tragedy. While Althusser's theory is a worthy attempt to de-Stalinize Marxism, it ultimately fails to do so on its own terms. I find that only one of the texts composing the line of critique passes both tests mentioned earlier. Raywin Cannell's critique from promiscuity. I do not find many arguments convincing in the texts themselves that Althusser's theory of education is functionalist, lacks an account of agency, or fails on its own terms. Yet my account in part two is not meant to be and cannot be exhaustive. The purpose is to show that there is much to be desired in the line of critique cited by Apple and Giroux in their configuration of critical education and that critical education researchers, researchers should accordingly reconsider presum presumptions in the paradigm. The line of critique, generally speaking, is also vulnerable to a reductio ad absurdum argument when it comes to those scholars who applied Althusser's theory. If we assume the line of critique is true, we would expect there to be little worthy Marxist research inspired by Althusser. We might even expect to see non-Marxists, non-activists, bourgeois functionalists, and those committed to capitalist determinism taking up these claims. These claims would reduce social phenomena to their usefulness in maintaining equilibrium, leaving out notions of agency and class struggle. But this is far from the case. In part three, I present a line of scholarship providing ample evidence to the contrary. The line of scholarship also provides resources to respond to a question that has emerged recently in Althusserian studies of education. What would an Althusserian pedagogy look like? Paulo Freire 
perhaps the most famous and important figure in critical education, wrote that Althusser's theory of overdetermination prevents us from falling into mechanistic explanations, or what is worse, mechanistic action. This brief mention shows that a figure such as Freire understood that Althusser's theory of non-mechanistic action, theory as non-mechanistic rather than functionalist, and helpful for thinking through political action rather than leaving out a notion of agency. The passage from Freire gestures towards a line of thinking produced by a diverse group of researchers by race, gender, and nationality that offer meaningful applications, extensions, and constructive readings of Althusser's theory of education. Focusing on advancements in structure, reproduction, race, gender, and ideology, I argue that, I argue that this line of advance, distinct from the line of critique, converges on a distinct paradigm for left education thinking, I call structural education, which furnishes resources for a properly Althusserian pedagogy. Stuart Hall's work is an undercurrent running through the line of advance. His writing on the theory of articulation, race class, and encoding decoding provide a theoretical underpinning for many of the line of advances insights for education, particularly true in Zeus Leonardo's work on whiteness and education. In terms of structuralist thinking about education, Christian Baudelot and Roger S. Deblay's The Capitalist, Capitalist School in France is a paradigm case of little considered texts, at least in English, uh, inspired by Althusser's theory of education. And I didn't have time or space to consider carefully all the texts that I found as part of this research. Um, there's a book by Vasconi uh, in Argentina from 1974 that needs to be translated and studied as well. Looking at data from the French school system between 1968 and 1973, the authors use a framework that understands schools as part of an ideological state apparatus that are determined by and determine class struggle in a social formation. Baudelot and Estable critique ideologies of school to show that the apparently unified system is actually an uneven bifurcated network structured along class lines. And I show how the book's argument is original research to which Althusser's theory of education gave rise. I'll just footnote here that um, the capitalist school in France hasn't been translated into English from French, uh, which is wild. So I'm working on a translation of that now. Um, other examples of texts in the line of advance include Richard Johnson, who in 1979 charted an interesting synthesis between Althusserian and Thompsonian arguments when it comes to social reproduction, offering a concept of reproduction and struggle. Nikos Polancis' claims about education in the opening essay of Classes and Contemporary Capitalism takes up the theme of causality, pointing to the stupidity of the bourgeois education problematic that understands schools as the cause of inequality. Rather, critiquing prominent stratification theories, he asserts the opposite, an unequal structure is what causes schools to be as they are, not the other way around. American political economist of education, Martin Carnoy, clarifies this premise further in his early work on education and the state from the 1980s, putting Althusser and Polancis' thinking into context with Marx, Engels, Lenin, and Gramsci. Carnoy advances a theory of mediation. This theory claims that education as part of the state softens contradictions and struggles in the base. This theory also includes key contradictions in school's contribution to the class struggle as a mediator, such as the problem of over-education, uh, producing symbols of democracy, great inflation, and underemployment. The Althusserian theory also inspired a little-studied cohort of Marxist feminist research on gender, class, and education. Anne-Marie Wolfe is a great example, a liberation fighter with the African National Congress, who, among other things, helped her husband, a comrade of Nelson Mandela, escape from prison, uses Althusser to build out uh, uh, Poulancis' insights on structural determination to analyze girls' education. She also uses the theory of the ideological state apparatuses to think through issues in South African Bantu education. Other examples include Michelle Barrett's well-known theory of dual systems, a uniquely historical theory of how patriarchy articulates with capitalist exploitation in educational practice. Barrett devotes an entire chapter of the landmark Women's Oppression Today to education, spelling out this thinking, which I then examine. I look to a cohort of Marxist feminist education researchers who built on Althusser's research, providing examples of Barrett's historical approach to the articulation of patriarchy and capitalism in education, like Madeleine Arnault offered a political economy of girls' education focusing on docility. Rosemary Deem, in her history of gender and education in women in schooling, provides examples of gendered and classed interpolations from the history of school policy, curriculum, and practice. And the American educational researcher, Linda Valley, put Althusser's theory to use in analyzing gender and class in a vocational program 
focused on girls becoming clerical workers. Like Deem, Valley's study provides a, a case study for interpolations uh, into what this cohort, a Marxist feminist, called the sexual division of labor. Finally, Althusser's theory inspired advances in thinking about ideology, specifically his landmark concept of interpolation. Stuart Hall made significant advances. He famously claimed that there are no guarantees in ideology, which emerges from his reading of Althusser's concept of uneven development. Hall applied these ideas in another seminal essay on encoding and decoding messages in media, putting forward the idea that codes get negotiated in the process of their being issued as interpolations to recruit for dominant relations of production, giving space for oppositional codes to emerge, either through misunderstanding or creative articulation. These essays provide a clear and distinct account of contingency, freedom, and contradiction in Althusserian structuralism. And while Hall does not ex explicitly extend the concept of interpolation to cover oppositional, oppositional and negotiated codes, Jean-Jacques Le Cirque wrote of the notion of counter-interpolation to this end, maybe perhaps what is implicit in Hall. Le Cirque's counter-interpolation refers to the taking up and taking on of interpolations that shifts a balance of forces, insulting the insult of an interpolation of dominant ideology. The concept has important implications for critical education, Yet interpolation has been taken in still other directions in educational theory. Tyson Lewis, in his provocative reading of early versus late Althusser, conceived of disinterpolation, a moment of suspension between interpolation and counterinterpolation, which Lewis claims is more educative than counterinterpolation. Consistent with Paul's findings regarding the power of creative misunderstanding and the, pace of, the place of possibility between coded message and its decoding, the literary theorist James Martell has elaborated the concept of misinterpolation, or when recruitment misfires, breaks down, or has unintended consequences. He cites the cases of Haitian revolutionaries misinterpreting the French calls for universal dignity and third world revolutionaries responding to Woodrow Wilson's calls for sovereignty, pointing the, to the ways that interpolations are subject to the anarchy of everyday life. These developments and augmentations together form a set of resources from which theorists could construct an Althusserian pedagogy. In the conclusion, I draw together the findings of each part of the book to put forward one account of that pedagogy by using the structural education framework initiated by Althusser's theory of education, extended by the line of advance and challenged by the line of critique. The framework is distinct from critical education and makes different insights possible in left educational thinking. Reflecting on the 11 rules and the line of advance, I contrast educa critical education with structural education. Thus, the reassessment of Althusser's theory, how it was advanced, and the foundations of critical education and its line of critique at minimum is an occasion to explore other frameworks like the structural, particularly given the resurgence of socialism into the mainstream in the United States and elsewhere. In the epilogue, I sketch how this framework has helped me in my own teaching, organizing, and research, and a set of practices which I characterize as belonging to an Althusserian pedagogy and invite critiques of my interpretation of Althusser set out in the text. Two related notes and I'm headed towards the end of the introdu introduction. First, this book on Althusser is not intuitively Althusserian in style. I have chosen to maintain what I take to be a straightforward, academic, and semi-descriptive tone throughout the text. With this style, I hope to give Althusser's ideas a hearing with audiences beyond that of Althusserian studies. Relatedly, due to space constraints, I have not been able to properly trace the philosophical influences on Althusser from Gramsci, Spinoza, Lacan, and others. There's a case to be made for this style, as consistent with Althusser's project of returning to texts, listening carefully and close interpretation, as well as engaging with the specific terrain one confronts in one's moment. But readers will notice a difference, which is in intentional as a contribution to Althusser studies. I have found that authors can sometimes use a certain speculary mode of expression when writing about Althusser that teeters into the unhelpful. This, sty this style may be weighed down by obscure references or technical poetic voicing, such that it becomes inscrutable at best, and at worst, impractical, pedagogically, intellectually, and politically. This is not a critique of any account specifically, but rather a stylistic preference I developed while writing the book. Finally, while Althusser's writing is certainly that kind of dis uh, specularity style, Derrida scholar Samir Haddad has pointed out that we must understand this sort of writing as inhabiting a style dominant in elite French universities, particularly in the humanities, during the time when Althusser was attending school and university. I did not have this curricular and pedagogical upbringing and see nothing essentially Althusserian about mimicking it. 
Second, Althusser's personal life is and has been relevant to the project. Althusser is perhaps best known now for the psychotic break he suffered in 1980 that led him to kill his wife, Helene Rittman. I believe this was a terrible act committed by an individual who long suffered from mental illness. I believe the response from the French government to find Althusser unfit to stand trial was suspect and that the patriarchal forces at work in the juridical outcome still permeate legal and scholarly apparatuses. At the same time, the contributions Althusser made to left education thinking have been positive for intellectual and political struggle, including advances in Marxist feminism. They have much to teach us about the history of left thinking in education and current struggles on the education terrain. So I follow William S. Lewis in seeing both the value and danger in studying Althusser's thinking. There is value in the depth and novelty of Althusser's thought, but there's danger in lifting up an author with such a fraught life. Given the research I've completed for this book and how it was influenced in my own organizing, uh, as I discuss in the epilogue, I've decided as a scholar and an organizer that the former value waits out the, outweighs the latter and welcome critique along these lines. Okay, so there you have the introduction. And now what I'd like to do is move into a more uh, higher education specific uh, portion. So I'm going to share my screen actually and go to a presentation that I've prepared with a few slides. If you just excuse me for a moment. Okay, so we just heard a bit of my book. There's the cover. Okay, so we're going to move now into higher education. So the first thing I wanted to do is read a, a few paragraphs from the very beginning of that first section that sets the scene of the uh, ideological state apparatuses essay. Um, I myself, when going into this, you know, I knew about the immensity of May 68 in Paris, but I didn't know the exact movement logistics of how it comes about. So I, I trace that context here. So it started with an explosion. On March 18th, 1968, a group of Parisian students identifying themselves as commandos set off bombs in the offices of American corporations, notably American Express. Sharing a global uh, imagination antagonistic to imperialism, they suspected these companies of complicity in the U.S. invasion of Vietnam. Two days later, on March 20th, police arrested suspects for the bombing. The Nanterre campus of Paris University, which historians have described as a concrete nightmare in a nightmarish landscape, uh, was a site of related tensions between left student groups and administration. Some of the student groups identified as les arrangés, or the angry ones. One of the students suspected in the March 18th action was studying at Nanterre. So on March 22nd, a coalition, a group of anarchists, Trotskyites, and Maoists in les arrangés, along with a group called the Vietnam Solidarity Committee, occupied an administrative office on the Nanterre campus to demand the suspected student's release. Student actions at Nanterre did not come out of nowhere. There had already been tensions in Nanterre and other campuses as part of the years-long struggle by the student unions and the French university system's dysfunctional Fouchette plan. The Fouchette plan both increased student enrollments and implemented restrictive examinations, which, as Bourdieu and Passeron famously examined, in 1979, selected and exclude stu excluded students from continuing on in higher education. Uh, they write, students were rightly aware of the fact that 70% of them were eliminated by examinations. The students, who, students also fought for sexual liberation as the dormitories were sparked by gender, as dormitories were separated by gender. Student protests against imperialism and capitalism's bureaucratic excesses happened in rhythm with particular demands for more inclusive and liberatory educational institutions. And it was these critiques which became the subject of an intellectual dialogue between Althusser and his student, Jacques Rancière, between 64 and 69, which I'm about to get to in a minute. Léon Raget combined these two threads of critique in the spring of 1968. They formed a new movement called the Movement of March 22nd, or M22, during their occupation. M22's goals were to use student discontent to detonate a general of revolt in society. That was their quote. The thing is, it worked. Nanterre's administration retaliated, arresting students. Some of the students arrested from the Sor were from the Sorbonne campus of Paris University. The students at the Sorbonne then protested against how the administration treated their comrades in the incident. Administrators retaliated with police force at the Sorbonne against more protesters, the instability increasing over April. By May 2nd, administrators in Nanterre had had enough, and they shut the university down, flooding the campus with police and threatening to expel leaders 
of the student movements. Students from the Sorbonne joined their peers at Nanterre to protest. Then a few days later, the largest student union in France called for a march. And the picture you're looking at here is actually a groups of the M22 movement meeting. On May 6, 20,000 students and teachers marched toward Nanterre. The police struck back violently. After this first encounter, high school students, as well as young workers, joined the growing fight. Their demands were to drop charges against student activists, remove police from Nanterre, and reopen the university. Negotiations began there, began, and there was a report that the universities were reopening, but it was a false report, and students and their supporters found campuses still occupied with police forces, enraging them further. The police blocked students from entering campus, so the students put up barricades in the streets, hearkening back to the Paris Commune of 1871. The police, following orders from the infamous chief, Remoris Grimaud, then attacked in the middle of the night on May 10th. The ensuing riot was televised, and the police were blamed for inciting it. In solidarity with the students, federations of unions called a general strike. One million workers marched. The police and government retreated, and they agreed to the new movement's demands, but students were emboldened. They occupied their universities, renaming them People's Universities, which then inspired workers to occupy their factories. Against the wishes of union leadership in the Communist Party, by the end of the month, nearly 10 million workers, or 20% of the French population, were on strike. The events in France in 1968 surpassed other movements that had inspired them, like those in Germany and the United States. Workers defying their union leadership and the advice of the communist leadership shut down the French economy, all to support the student actions earlier in May. We might say, then, that the most significant disruption to modern capitalist social formations post-war started at school. Louis Althusser missed these events. He was in the hospital. In the preface to the English translation of On the Reproduction of Capitalism, his student, Etienne Balibar, tries to answer the question of where the ideological state apparatuses essay came from, specifically why Althusser would publish an excerpt of the larger book in 1970 before finishing it. The movements and worker strikes in May 1968, um, particularly the crucial role students played in them, had made an impression on Althusser. And as Balabar notes, even secondary students had mobilized. The turn to schooling and education by Althusser and his students was an attempt to make sense of these events, which the French Communist Party and union leadership and Althusser himself were critical. So there's the context of higher education. The ISA's essay is really born um, as a kind of response to what's going on amongst the students. But the thing is, there was a, a long um, a movement of students against the French university system that Althusser was sort of part of. And um, in this last section that I wanna read, it, th that sets the tone for the debate between himself and, uh, and his student, Jacques Rancière. And so I just wanna uh, go through a brief little history of the, this early con uh, conflict between the two of them uh, that I think ends up being a kind of constructive uh, or er and heuristic dialogue. So, in 1964, I just want to go through this timeline before I finish up. 1964, Althusser publishes an essay called Student Problems, and it's a response, actually, to student demands, student demands that our students are making at the university. Then in 1969, right after the events of uh, 68, at a people's university, an autonomous student-led university, uh, Ranciere leads a seminar called Theories of Ideology that ends up being a thorough critique uh, of Althusser. And then in 1970, just a year later, we have the ISA's essay or the Ideological State Apparatus's essay that was Althusser's. So what I, what I want to cover here is just a little bit of um, what's at stake in this uh, debate between the two, uh, Althusser and Ranciere, and specifically Ranciere's uh, contribution, I think, to Althusser's changing of mind uh, uh, about the concept of ideology and um, how in this debate, what we actually see is a really fascinating application of uh, Althusser's theory to the higher education context, um, which maybe we should call Ranciere's theory, as you'll see. So um, the, the thing that I'm going to be drawing from the most here is this book, Althusser's Lesson by Jacques Ranciere, which is his first book um, published in 1974. And it's a, it's a polemic. I mean, it's a, it's a recounting of very specific movement details from, uh, from the moment of the 60s uh, that Ranciere was a student leader in, but it's very much about the break between himself and student organizers and Althusser and a split between the old left and the new left in France. 
Um, but in the back, there's an addendum to this book, uh, which I found super fascinating. And that's what I'm going to talk about now, just for a few minutes. So there's an essay uh, that Rancière wrote called On the Theory of Ideology, Althusser's Politics. And this essay was a write-up of a course Rancière taught at an autonomous student-led university born out of the events of 68. It was June of that year. And the course was meant to primarily comment on Marx text on ideology, but he says quite quickly became an instrument for reflection on the Althusserian theory of the battle of science against ideology. And then a plan to publish the essay went in an unexpected direction. And this is, this is Rancière talking now. At the end of the semester, Saul Karge, who attended the course, asked me to write an article based on it for a collection of essays on Althusser to be published in Argentina. It is quite likely that he showed my piece to Althusser and possible also that it might have played a part in Althusser's introduction of the notion of ideological state apparatuses to his thought, end quote. So what Rancière is saying there is that Althusser read Rancière's essay and composed the ISA's essay with it in mind the following year. Greg, uh, Gregory Elliott notes that Althusser started writing the ISA's essay in March of 69, leaving ample time between Rancière's writing and the publish, uh, publication of the uh, ISA's essay for that to be true. And Elliott also cites an interview published in a, in a German collection where Althusser indicates that he read Rancière's criticisms and that they had merit. Althusser's ideas in the ISA's actually and the, the ideological state apparatuses essay actually read like a response to Rancière's critiques, um, or perhaps the incorporation of a constructive criticism. So I just want to go through a little bit of uh, some of Rancière's thinking in this essay on the theory of ideology and, and finish up with some thinking about higher education. So on the theory of ideology is a direct response to Althusser's 64 essay on student problems. Which, um, and so we're going to see about the dialogue between these two pieces. The essay student problems which argues against, against student calls for more participatory pedagogies in the classroom, Rancière sets the scene here. Althusser's early essay was an intervention in a disagreement on the left between the party, between Communist Party and students over demands to change French universities. Party officials made quantitative demands for more campuses and more professors, while students, on the other hand, made qualitative demands like making pedagogy less alienating. Althusser in 1964 disagreed with the students, recommending that they put curricular content before the form of teaching in their demands. How we teach, he said, matters less than what we teach. Putting content before form, he insists, is a strategic point that makes a bigger difference in the class struggle. The university can change its pedagogy to modern methods or even keep the old ones, and so students risk committing themselves to a confusion, he says, that misses how capitalism via positivism encourages researchers to be blind operatives for capital. Furthermore, teachers are a front line against ideological content. He says their knowledge can be weapons of scientific learning and that they offer scientific and critical training that the government fears. Students who insist on participationist or anarcho-democratic forms of pedagogy might miss these learnings, leading to what he calls a half knowledge or a weak knowledge that makes them easier to manipulate. Teachers as trained experts can work against this reproduction by passing along their knowledge. But Althusser also insists on the more philosophical point that pedagogic equality between teachers and students is mistaken because this does not correspond with the, re with the reality of the pedagogical function. He points to a basic inequality between teacher and student that the student movements miss. That philosophical notion would inspire vociferous disagreement with the student Rancière and eventually inspire his landmark book, The Ignorant Schoolmaster, which, which argues the opposite. Indeed, as I mentioned later, one of Rancière's stated goals in his theoretical work generally in the preface to Althusser's lesson is to show how liberatory theories can oppress. In the 60, 1969 text, where Rancière is sort of responding to Althusser, he understands that, 60, that 1964 essay as indicative of the political consequences of Althusser's theory of ideology and responds to his teacher, taking aim at Althusser's distinction between science and ideology. Rancière's critique of Althusser's concept of ideology and science and the suggestions Rancière makes to change this concept look like an account of the ideological state apparatuses Althusser would produce later in 1970. Rancière takes issue with the Marxist concept of science that casts it as an opposite or other of ideology, which would be positivist. Rather, knowledge is caught up in the class struggle. Thus, Althusser's latent positivism is counter to Marxism. Rancière says that there's a strategic consideration here, 
He says, knowledge, like state power, is an object of the class struggle and must, like state power itself, be destroyed. Science is not a matter of producing positivistically true knowledge over false knowledge. Rather, science should be about destroying the knowledge produced by dominant classes. Knowledge is an object of class struggle, but knowledge is more than just curricular content. It is the system of knowledge delivery itself. Rancière cites science instruction in the universities as an example. He argues that science classes are reactionary rather than revolutionary, not because of the content of the course, but because of the structures within these courses, within which these courses take place, institutions, mechanisms, relations, hierarchies within the university. Rancière points to consultants as one example of institutional practices that tinge knowledge with class struggle. It is therefore the configurations of knowledge within the institutions that manifest ideology, not knowledge that is positivistically true or false. And readers would be right to see the seeds of Althusser's concept of the ISA and Rancière's claim here, as he is all but saying that concrete practices provide material support for dominant ideologies and realize these ideologies within modern institutions and as such reproduce capital. Even more of what Althusser would claim in the ISA's essay is clearly present in Rancière, uh, when he says that ideology exists within concrete practices like testing, disciplinary divisions, and departmental configurations. These practices realize state power, says Rancière, which serve the interests of the ruling class. And he even writes that this dominant ideology is organized in a collection or system of institutions, which includes the information system. Rancière goes so far as to articulate the idea that ideology is not consciousness or a social imaginary, but rather practices enacted in diffuse apparatuses. So just to finish here, I think the questions that this debate broaches are really interesting to consider. Um, you know, the first question is, where is ideology in the university? Is it in the syllabus or is it in the institution? Uh, what's more ideologically potent in the university classroom, the content of the knowledge or the form of its delivery? Uh, what's more important for student organizers, careful study or direct action? And if the left takes state power, what should officials' attitude be towards disobedience, disruptions, and challenges to state authority? And must there be a pedagogical relation of inequality between teacher and student? So that's what I have. Thank you so much for, for listening to me um, and spending some time with that. I'm really eager to hear uh, your thoughts and, and the reaction. Okay, thank you, David. Uh, and uh, I think we'll go, uh, go back as well to this slide at some point. But uh, right now, I would like to invite uh, Jakub to uh, formulate a response and also add, add up some, some questions uh, and comments to your talk and the book in general. Okay, good afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Jakub. I'm also a part of uh, Scholarly Communication Research Group. Thank you, David, for, um, for your talk. Uh, it was a pleasure. It was also a pleasure to, to read your book. And in what follows, I would like to raise three points. Two uh, are a bit broader, let, let's, let's call them philosophical points. Uh, and, and finally, in the third point, I would like to mention uh, uh, a question or an issue more directly related to um, educational issues. So without further ado, I would like just to make a, maybe a small caveat, um, because uh, of course I'm not an Althusserian scholar as such. Uh, my knowledge of Althusser was always mediated uh, by my interest in, in what's called red spinozism or um, presence of Spinoza in, 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 in contemporary Marxist tradition. But this is important for me and for how I try to read your book and the argument that you um, develop in it. Why this is important? Because of course, when we take uh, famous texts of Althusser, uh, that is uh, his essays in self-criticism, uh, Althusser mentions there that in fact, when people accused him of being structuralist, he was in fact guilty of a much greater sin. And this greater sin is him being a Spinozian, not a structuralist. Right, um, so so I was always trying to take uh, Altizer at his word in this sense, and and to read him as a as a first and foremost reader of um, Spinoza, along of course being a reader of uh, of Karl Marx, uh, and. When I tried to approach your book from this sort of premise, for me, what was interesting is 
a certain tension that I find at the very heart of Althusser's fear of, of ideology. So what I mean by this tension? Um, on the one hand, Althusser is, of course, in the ESA essay, pr produces maybe for the first time in, in, in Marxist theory, what we can call a truly materialist theory of ideology, right? And, and this is in a very articulated in a very Spinozan sense, because what in fact Althusser does in this essay is he sort of repeats Spinozian gesture when Spinoza uh, said that Deus sive natura, right? So God or nature, Althusser is in fact saying consciousness or practice, right? He's saying ideology is, is very much embodied is immanent to practice, is immanent to our bodies. And, and in that sense, he is producing a materialist approach towards ideology. But on the other hand, I would say that this consciousness, which was purged in the first step, resurfaces or reemerges in the, uh, in the, of course, interpolation physics of his um, of his um, argument. And of course, this is not only my argument, but, but, but I'm following, for example, Warren Montag's argument in his book, Altizer and his contemporaries. So what Montag, and, and uh, by following Montag, I am saying is in fact, Altizer is trying to purge theory of ideology for some kind of you know, drama of recognition, when in fact, this drama of recognition is re-entering the picture. And why this matter? Because for me, uh, and I would like to ask about it, it might be more problematic uh, to uh, sort of propose this division between critical pedagogy on one hand and structural education without dealing with this tension, right? Because for me at the philosophical or conceptual level, this division is basically a division between between materialist theory of ideology and then this, this, this theory of, of recognition. But in Althusser, it's not separated. It is produced in, in a certain tension. So, so I would like to ask you whether you can maybe uh, refer to this and, and try to untangle this node with you know, um, embodied and materialist uh, account of ideology in Althusser and then and, and, um, interpolation, ideology interpolating individual as subject as a certain drama of recognition. That leads me also to the second issue. Uh, what, I was, uh, what, I, what I find quite interesting in your book, that, that for me you are, I'm not saying overlooking, but decided to not discuss for me, at least, one of the most interesting readers of Althusser, and, and the reader who, although rarely, if ever, discusses Althusser directly, nonetheless produce his, his theory in a response to, to Althusserian essay. And by that, I mean, of course, Michel Foucault uh, and his discipline and punishment. This is also important for me because um, I think that, Al uh, that, that Michel Foucault was, uh, was the philosopher who acknowledged the problem and the tension that I mentioned in the first, um, first question. And, and his theory can be, uh, can be seen as a, as a sort of, you know, going beyond this tension that when, when, when of course, um, Foucault is interested in, in technologies of individualization, he says that, okay, individual is not something that, that, that precedes the subject as in the interpolation, um, in Althusser interpolation, but in fact, this individual is in self uh, produced through certain um, um, power mechanism and power, power relations. And this is also important for me because of course, Foucault, we know that, that he had a very um, complicated relation to Marx and Marxism, sometimes, sometimes open hostility, but of course he was, in fact, maybe in all of his writing discussing uh, with Marx and, 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 and following, his, following his, his, his ideas. Now, Marx, now, now in the Marxian studies, Foucault is kind of re-entering the picture, right? Uh, for example, Jason Reed, Sandro Mezadra are, are, are all trying to figure out how we can establish sort of a connection between Marx and Foucault. And how they try to approach, it, approach this issue 
is they try to approach it through the production of subjectivity, right? And, and, and this is for me something that Altizer, Altizer brushed maybe a bit, but ultimately, and for me, this is a tragedy of Altizer, not, not, not the one <laughs> that, that you mentioned um, in, in, in historical critics, that he almost arrived at this point, but doesn't quite make the last step, you know? That the production of subjectivity, when we take Marx and Foucault together, is always, always has a sort of a double meaning. And by this double meaning, I mean that on the one hand, production of subjectivity refers to particular subjective compartment. And this is something Altizer accounts for because he discusses how a certain working class, both skilled and docile is produced. But what he fails to account at the same time is this other meaning of pro production of subjectivity that is productive power of producing wealth. And wealth, which is something that, you know, pushes against capitalist forms that are imposed on it. So, so, so uh, I was wondering if you could maybe um, uh, in, in your response, maybe di discuss uh, your take on, 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 on Foucault's reading on, on Althusser and, and how you would place him uh, in the picture that you, um, that you painted uh, in your book. Uh, and last issue, as, uh, as I said, uh, this is an issue much more um, uh, referring to, to education itself is, um, for me at least, uh, Marx and critic uh, is, uh, is, is, first of all, an integral critic. And what I mean by integrity of Marx and critic is it, it accounts for three moments of critic. It sort of accounts for the in moment of critic. So being, ha having a experience of being, you know, in a sector subsumed by, by capital, it accounts for the against moment. So it accounts that the relation between capital and labor is, of course, on the most basic level, an antagonistical relation. But it does so also in reference to what sometimes is, it's called beyond moment of critic. That is, both in and against are pushing towards something new, probably towards some kind of post-capitalism, hopefully, at least. And, and I was really interesting about, mm, about this because from your book, I, I have this sort of idea that I know a lot of Altizer's educational take on the in moment of critique and against moment of critique. But I was wondering if you can maybe try to uh, tell us something. What can Altizer tell, tell us about this beyond moment of critique? That is, what can we learn from Altizer uh, about some kind of post-capitalist organization of education? That would be my three questions. Thank you very much. Okay, David, the floor is yours. And you can use even the uh, uh, C word, la, la, like without being shy, the, the communism, not post-capitalism. Like we are not afraid of this word. Okay, that's, that's uh, we can say it? Okay. Um, this is great. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Jakob, for those comments. Um, very thoughtful. Uh, but also very deep. Um, let me see. I'll just I'll try to uh, I'll try to address them here in order. So I think your comment about the uh, I really have to think about this comment actually the way in which the way in which um, so there's there's Montag's reading which is that this theory is full of problems. It's full of tensions. It's full of issues. It's fascinating. Let's think about it. But it's full of problems. That you know that's that's I think Montag's take very subtle. Um, I, lo I love that book uh, about Althusser's contemporaries um, and your, your characterization of the distinction I'm trying to draw between critical and structural education as being uh, sort of wrapped up in the tension uh, between what we'd call, like you're calling a drama of recognition rather than a materialist politics um, and where that stands. Um, and that's something I really have to give more thought to. My like initial impressions uh, here are when I go after, after writing this book and doing all the reading that I did for it, um, I, when I go back and I read Montag, I, I just, I feel different about Althusser than Montag does when I'm reading Montag. You know, I love his work. It's been so helpful for me, but I just don't think, I think that the story of the theory is fraught and full of tension. 
But I don't know if the theory itself is as fraught and full of tension, if that makes sense. Um, and I never, I, I didn't, I didn't see uh, in when I was going back and looking at this, the the way in which Montag says that 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 consciousness consciousness kind of enters the picture um, in Althusser in a problematic way. I actually think that that's a problem for materialism generally. Like this is like a contradiction of materialism, which is that here you have this thing called materialism, which you know Marx was. Marx is trying to say, like, you know, it's the philosophers have interpreted the world. The point is to change it, and we're going to get down into the material conditions, and we're going to away from the ideal bourgeois. But, you know, as a friend of mine who I organized with in Occupy Wall Street, um, you know, told me, he was like, you know, and he, he after Occupy, he went in this direction of healing and, um, and uh, you know, uh, the consciousness um, raising in a kind of new age metaphysical sense. And he was like, the problem for materialism is that itself is an object of consciousness. You know, that, that it itself is, an, is, is a, an element of consciousness. It's always sort of trapped in there. Um, and so I just never detected that. I never detected that kind of, uh, if it's a tension, it's a tension, I agree. I never detected it as a bit of a problem. Because it's something that I think um, materialism itself has to hold. Uh, and I think Althusser does an okay job of it. But when it comes to the difference between critical and structural, like I say, I really have to think about that. Um, I think my, no, my second initial impression on this question is that, to me, the whole, the whole picture is materialist. And it's, it's uh, not necessarily an either or when it comes to structural critical. But it's rather in the structural, and I, I, in the conclusion, I offer this metaphor is that um, in the structural education, what I'm imagining is like, I just kept thinking because there's so much uh, rock imagery in Althusser, there's a lot of geological imagery that comes from Gramsci, I think, uh, and elsewhere. Uh, I kept thinking about rocks uh, and sedimentary levels and things like this. And I kept thinking about the relationship between rivers and um, the earth that they're flowing within, you know? And to me, um, Structural education is an emphasis on the the relationship between the water and the rock that contains it. And works critical education is really just focused on like trying to always attune to the the quick movements of water um, and the always oppressiveness of the rock and the sort of the you know, but always focus on that that movement of the water. What structural education is trying to do is actually show that like the rock, is is very obdurate. It, it's a structure, you know, it, but it, it itself changes um, in relationship. Water can pound rock and change it over time, but it also influences the water. It carries the water. Um, and so it's it, rather than a, an either or materialism and what we could call spiritualism or immaterialism or idealism, I would I would rather fit that distinction within materialism itself, but it's two different maybe approaches to um, approaches to materialism. And the structural is trying to give that, like understand the that rock and what it is, how it can move, but also how it doesn't, um, which obviously got out to Sarah, you know, in trouble in terms of the structuralism. Um, and I'll just say that in the debate, and I think Montag will go in a different direction, in the debate about whether out to Sarah is a structuralist, because in, like you say, in essays and self-criticism, you know, he says he's not. I, I like to hold to the structuralism. Um, and maybe this is a bit misanthropic of me, but... Um, I studied, I studied with a, a structuralist in undergraduate named Peter Cause, who, um, who wrote a book on structuralism. And I just find it, uh, I find the concept of structure and, you know, the tools that it provides as being very helpful. Um, and I like the fact that Althusser is inhabiting a structuralism that is imminent. And there's a lot of productive um, theoretical uh, work that can happen in that um, you know, hold by holding those together, which of course, you know, are intention because you end up with all kinds of crazy phrases like uh, determined in the last instance or, um, you know, process about a subject, et cetera. But um, I think that actually these things are very helpful. So then actually I'm going to then jump to your third question uh, and pivot from there and then I'll get to the second one. So um, I love that distinction between the moments of critique, actually. I'm going to use that, I think, um, in, against, and beyond. So what's the beyond? Uh, and what I'd say here is, um, what, like what I was just saying, when we hold, when we have this sort of theoretical framework of imminent structuralism, I think what what Althusser provides is a method to engage in organizing, to engage in work 
where we can conceive of ourselves as in a certain kind of dynamic, complex, non-essentialized relationship to, to class struggle, where there's a contribution to class struggle, um, but a recognition that we're also caught up in that class struggle. So we're determined by and determining it. And the, that, that's what I would say is the, the beyond aspect of the critique, because, you know, I think it's interesting, Christian, you said, we can say communism, you know, um, and I, you know, what I, what I think is nice about this Althusserian method, which in my, my favorite passage of Althusser's is in, is it simple to be a Marxist in philosophy? And, you know, he's talking about, that's the essay I think everyone should read. The first thing they read of Althusser, that's, the, that's what it should be, frankly. Um, and in that, in that, he has a passage where he says, the whole point is to understand where you are in the social formation, what forces you can exert, what's being exerted on you, and act responsibly and accordingly. And I think that that's what Althusser's method does. It doesn't tell us a priori, um, you know, like a more, um, you know, Hegelian inflected dialectic would say that we're inevitably headed towards communism from capitalism. Um, it, it was a thorough rejection of that. It would never tell us exactly what was beyond, but it would be a way of, um, you know, when we're focused on the horizon and on the beyond, you can kind of dream, you can get overwhelmed, you can overshoot, you can, you can not necessarily, you can lose sight of the exact terrain that's in front of you and how to operate in your next step and the step after that in order to achieve what you're trying to do or a direction that you're trying to go. And I feel like Althusser's theory really ultimately for me personally does that. Um, and so it doesn't necessarily stipulate uh, a, an exact be beyond but it does give us the tools to think about the situation that we're in and a transition to something like socialism, um, a con construct a concept of socialism, um, you know, essentially sort of in, in line with what Gramsci is saying, you know, that, that the, the, the um, old is dying, the new is yet to be born. How do we, how do we uh, birth, give birth to that newness while the old is dying? Here we have, I think, a theory um, that really um, compels us uh, to do that. Um, as an example, I'll just say my current work, I, I, I'm studying school finance now. <laughs> I'm studying, um, you know, how money works in education and how to, like, I'm reading about the Federal Reserve and reading bond statements to try and advise policymakers, socialist policymakers on how school funding can work that's consistent with a socialist theory. And I feel like Althusser is at the, at, the, at the heart of that. Um, Okay, and then I'll, I'll, I know I'm rambling a little, but let me get to Foucault. So I think the first thing I'll say about Foucault is that I am not a Foucault scholar. So um, the, the book that I was, wrote here, one of the things that I really wanted to do was to focus. And I feel like a lot of critical education theory, you know, that I'd read in my studies is a lot of sort of all over the place. You bring in this, you bring in that, you bring it, you, you take from everywhere, you know, and you associate, you free associate. And, and I was just like, I'm sick of that. I really want to focus. I really want to get down and hew to what this person in these texts is saying so that I can understand it, so that other people can understand it. And, um, you know, I encountered Foucault around every corner, but I just, I did not feel confident in making any statements about Foucault because I, to be able to feel comfortable doing that, I would have to have done another project on Foucault and I didn't feel like it. Um, so, uh, you know, I I think if Foucault is missing, it's because I really really wanted to focus and not and not um, distract away from Althusser. That said, I came away with certain questions or hypotheses, you know, that I would lead me into um into to things that I might say about Foucault. You know, so one thing that one thing that I encountered was that Foucault was a younger contemporary of Althusser. So he's not a student of Althusser. He went to some Althusser seminars. But, you know, like I just saw a tweet the other day, you know, that Derrida, Althusser is supposed to read Derrida as a thesis, master's thesis, right? And Althusser was like, I don't understand this. I don't know what this means. I know a guy who would. He sends it to Foucault, who's a younger professor over at another institution. And uh, he's like, oh, uh, Michel, can you read this thing? I don't know what to make of it. You know, and then Foucault is like, well, it's either A plus or F. I don't know. Um, and so... But when I when I think about what I've learned about Althusser and then what I know from what I know of Foucault, my sense is actually that Foucault is just applying Althusser. Frankly, like this is what Althusser looks like in application, um, because it's not because I think within Althusser, you know, I don't I don't know if he doesn't make that last step that you're talking about about the sort of construction of the individual. You know, he says that in, in um, 
in the last chapter of On the Reproduction of Capitalism, which is about ideology, which is a beautiful chapter, totally expanded from the discussion of ideology in the ISAs. Um, you know, he talks about, um, you know, that subject, subjectivity itself uh, is, is like when you realize I'm me, or like when you introduce yourself to someone, or when, when you, he gives this example that I love, he has all these really little examples. And he says, you knock on a friend's door and they say, who is it? And you say, it's me. He's like, that's, that's interpolation. Um, like literally your own sense of your own me-ness, so to speak, is, uh, is the result of ideological, you know, ideological fluctuations in, um, and uh, in the social formation. And so I, you know, I think it's actually Foucault is sort of taking forward this project there's, there are the seeds of post-Marxism in Althusser, for sure. And I think, out, and I think uh, Foucault is sort of taking that and running with it. Um, that's my hypothesis. But it's, like I say, unsubstantiated from, um, from close study. Okay, that's... Okay, thank you for the spices. Uh, and so I would open a floor for all the participants to ask the questions. Maybe if Jakub wants to briefly respond, like by less than a minute, then it's okay. And then we'll simply collect questions and start uh, moving forward uh, with the discussion. Jakub, would you like to say something? Maybe I will respond uh, uh, later on just to give other participants a chance because I'm worried that I will talk uh, much longer than a minute. Thank you, David, for your answers. This is, uh, you know, there's already many things that uh, that I would like to say. Um, but uh, as I said, it will be best to give others voice and maybe at the end return to this uh, discussion. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, Rasmus. All right. Thank you very much, uh, David, for, uh, for the presentation. It was really interesting, and I especially uh, I, I, I dabbled some, you could say, in in Althusserian uh, theory as a philosophy student. Uh, so it was great to to revisit um, some of that. Uh, but what I wanted to take your brain about is uh, because that's what I'm working on myself now is uh, the theories of nationalism and how nationalism fits into El Tusser, um, in the sense or in the context of yeah ISA's uh, ideological state apparatuses, right? Because when you read the literature on the history of higher education, history of universities, one of the major points is of course that universities are or have been a major key actor in nation state building and producing, you could say, nationalist ideology or or yeah, state nationalism. Um, so does Althusser have any considerations of, of nationalism um, or is he sort of following the, <laughs> the, the, the old Marxist line of just pushing uh, the, the idea of nationalism to the side and not really considering as, uh, as, a, as a relevant uh, concept? Yeah, this is a this is a good question. So there's a couple answers to this. One is one is more immediate, which is that um, in in the, in the 1970, the ISA's essay, Althusser is sort of um, coming to his new, like uh, Jacob had said, materialist theory of ideology. You know, which we see in the concept of the apparatus and in the, in interpolation. But he's also dealing with the residuals of his previous theory of ideology, which was less intentionally materialist. And that was the thing that Rancière was really coming at him for. His, that theory, the previous one, said that ideology, particularly when it comes to the ISAs, and you know, he used school as an example, has four main themes. Uh, and one of them is the economy. Uh, one of them is um, individualism. But the another one is nationalism. He says nationalism is one of the four. I can't remember what the fourth is off the top. Like humanism. That's right. Humanism, economy, individualism, nationalism. Those are the four main uh, planks, he would say, of uh, what he'd call state ideology or dominant ideology uh, in the formation. And so I think for him, nationalism is quite important. Um, you know, in the in the 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 formation um, uh, when he's analyzing it. And also in on the reproduction of capitalism, you know, which is the book that I studied most carefully for this text, 
you know, he, he gives clear examples throughout the book, um, particularly in that last chapter, of the role that nationalism plays in the in, interpolation of the subject. And, you know, he gives one example of himself, which I actually find to be very uh, like provocative and um, so, sort of endearing almost. He talks about himself in the third person. And he says, little Louis was born in Algiers, you know, et cetera. And then he says, is interpolated as a subject of France. Um, and he talks about his relationship to, to France, but then how that changes in 1940 and how he's also a subject of Catholicism. And he's, he becomes a communist. And um, so it plays a role, you know, and he also, he gives, there's a whole subsection of that chapter called a concrete example, um, which is also kind of funny because he's saying like, everyone's always hounding me for concrete examples. Okay, here's your concrete example. And he talks about a friend of his who's a worker leader in a, in a, uh, a car manufacturing plant. I um, can't remember what the big car manufacturer is, Citroen, Citroen. I don't know if I'm saying that correctly, but he's talking about this worker in the Citroen factory. And he's giving this very like, very kind of intimate portrait of this guy's life. You know, he's at the factory. When he's at the factory, he's doing his work. Um, but then, you know, he puts his hard hat and his suit in his locker, and then he becomes father of the family, and he becomes French citizen who goes on vacation, and, and he starts to think about sports and his marriage. And um, so, so the nationalism is in the mix there. Um, I wouldn't necessarily say it's a, it's it's a, a feature at the forefront, but I think it is mentioned, so that might be worth citing in your studies. The last thing I wanted to say, you know, the thing that I associate this with is his theory of the repressive to state apparatus, you know, and um, his, his in, in on the reproduction of capitalism, he gives a very kind of subtle account of, you know, what exactly is part of that na of that representative uh, re repressive uh, state apparatus? You know, you've got the police and you've got the army and you've got the court system, um, and you've got the laws. You know, and the laws are created in the in the national government. Um, and he he situates the the role of the nation. I would say it's right at the point between the repressive and the ideological. Um, because he actually talks about political parties and maybe even parliaments themselves as potentially being ideological state apparatuses, not repressive, which I found interesting. Um, so I think he, he can account for, for that. But I think I agree with you, you know, that it's not super, you know, there's an internationalism, I think, in Marxism, maybe that, that sidelines that. But there are some resources there. Thank you, David. Uh, are there any other questions? If you would like to ask David a question, simply raise your hand or simply uh, turn on the voice and uh, move on. Oh, nobody seems, it was super dense presentation plus plus a question se uh, session. So I, I understand how does that. Oh, Alexandra is. Okay. Thank Hi. You. Thank you. Thank you Hello. so much for your presentation, David. Thank you. Um, I am I am the resident like linguist in this group, so I am a little ah. bit further away from the philosophy part. Um, not not too much though. Uh, but I was wondering um, about your writing of the book because at some yep. point you were mentioning actually that uh, you were trying to write the book not in the way that um, like that. And correct me if I'm wrong. If there's like an Althusserian way of writing it and the language of it, and um, and you were, you know, I haven't read it yet. I just got the link. So could you say a little bit more about that part of your writing of the book you're reading, and and also the choice of the language? And I think you know that could be just also interesting for anyone who's attempting to write a book. And 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 how do you you know use choose the language and the style of your writing, um, especially in philosophy? Um, yeah, just just briefly maybe comment and just share your reflections. I appreciate that actually a lot um, because this is something that has come up in philosophy of education circles. Um, you know, while I've been a student in it, uh, which is um, you know there's a sort of consideration of the pedagogy of our writing um, and how it is that we actually interact with our readers and there's been some moves in my field over the last 10 years to really play with that, you know, to not, to not think of it as just a kind of, um, you know, secondary consideration and you write how you write and that's that, but actually that 
your style of writing is itself part of the project. And um, so I appreciate that your question follows on those lines. Uh, just a little background about me. I, I, for most of my life, wanted to be a fiction author and write novels. Um, and I did write fiction for uh, a long time. Um, and only now I'm getting back into it, but I've taken a long break for various reasons. And so style and voice was very um, important to me um, in my writing. And also writing fiction, writing long fiction, really helped me write academically, um, I'll say. And so when I was writing this book, I wanted to write it in a way that was intentional. And one thing that I'd noticed, I'd noticed these two things. On the one hand, in the philosophy of education, particularly Marxist education uh, philosophy, you have a very, um, I mean, it's heavily influenced by continental philosophy, you know, we would say. And um, not only that, but in education, there was a writer who herself was influenced by continental philosophy named Maxine Green, um, who, a great, great person, um, who r r lived and wrote over a fascinating period of time, you know, my my um, kind of moment on the left was Occupy Wall Street in 2011. Her moment on the left was going to Spain to fight for the anti-fascists. And um, she she turned philosophy of education in the United States around. Before that, there was a very analytic philosophy approach to writing, very step-by-step, -step, very um, aloof, very abstracted, very anti-Hegelian, anti-Russellian uh, way of writing. And she she... I messed that all up. She was like, nope, we should not be reading, writing this way. She was like the only woman in the room for 20 years. And um, essentially, I think her style became predominant. And her style was to, to quote a novel, to quote a poem, to quote a, a, a thing in the newspaper, to quote, um, you know, uh, uh, and, then, and then go into Hegel and then come back out again and then swarm and swoop. And, and it was, it's very dramatic. And um, I think it really was a great counter interpolation to um, that previously very restricted, you know, abstracted mode of being. But what I've noticed is that over time, I think this writing style lends itself to, because it's so associational, it goes wide rather than deep. Um, and I myself, my philosophical upbringing was in philosophy of mathematics and logic. Um, and I studied analytic philosophy very deeply. And I always retained a certain kind of love for certain ways of thinking in analytic philosophy, despite the fact that it's reactionary and idealistic and all these things that I hate. But there were certain things about it that really helped me as a, as a Marxist and as an organizer to really boil things down to what's being said, how they work together as an argument. Um, and so I feel like the style that I ended up writing, because I found so much Althusserian writing to be in that prosaic continental style, which I like. I like the feeling of it, but it 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 it's gotten a bit old for me. I wanted to do something new. And on the other hand, on education, I felt like there was this Maxine Green style sort of associational thing that perhaps maybe had been partially at the root of some of the misreadings of Althusser that I encountered, you know, because they were associational and they didn't go down and they didn't drill down and focus. Um, so I also wanted it to be readable, but also challenging. And so I I try to strike that tone in the book. Um, and try to make it kind of a little talky, but just like so, something I always wanted to to find a, a third way between analytic and continental, and, and even as an undergraduate. Um, and I feel like uh, this project actually is a a step in that direction. Okay, that sounds like a super successful peak moment like you right now uh, got the picture of uh you know like by the scenes of the outer like like workshop and you are like warmly invited to read david's book which is like open access accessible you got uh, like an introduction to that you see that it resonates with the audience and with the critics and i think that uh, uh it's really one of the nicest Christmas gift that you can give to yourself uh, to simply uh, download the file and read the book cover to cover because really well, like David's style is superb and the organization of the book is also uh, like really intriguing like it's not that you read uh, uh, an ac academic book like that every day usually they are like structured in a very dual way and David make 
made uh, a substantial effort to make the reading process fun. So uh, thank you, David, for, for being our guest today. Thank you, all of you the, who came. And uh, yeah, uh, we are looking forward to see you during our seminars in the next year. We'll have a lot of them, so 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 be prepared. If you want to stay in touch, like uh, consider subscribing uh, to our newsletter. Uh, like we have one, I will send a link in the uh, or somebody who has an access right now, like from the group, can post the link in the chat. And uh, yeah, stay in touch with us because uh, yeah, we will be back with other super good uh, things like the David Stock today. So, thank you very much and have a nice uh, Christmas break. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. So nice.